Susan Zink with Montessori for Everybody TV. Today I'm going to talk about using the materials that we tend to collect from some of the wonderful sources available today to use in the zoology section of Montessori classrooms. Regular school classrooms, in-home Montessori uh, rooms, segments of, of the, the home that, that you put together for your child. We have amazing resources that are available at this point. Um, all of the different kinds of models that are available from tiny ones that are, are sold in tubes to pretty good size ones. We can, can purchase real um, remains of animals uh, in the case of natural sponges and things like that to make available for our children and to get them interested and excited about doing research. And I'm going to suggest that that's where you want your focus to be, is how do you draw children into doing research. Now I'm going to talk about some specifics of using some of these amazing materials that are pretty easy to get and how to fill them out and flesh them out and make them even more useful and more accurate in teaching some of the more challenging concepts in zoology. We've got sets of animals from uh, different parts of the world. This is a, a, a set that's pretty easy to find for um, animals from Australia. Uh, has some of those very distinctive creatures that, uh, like the koala that we, we know are, are native only to that continent and that specific um, habitat in the world. What I'm going to suggest is that once you start to collect things like that, to make the materials more complete, you can do some things that uh, you may not have thought of. So if you're buying little figures like that, you probably also pick up cards in the dollar stores or the dollar section of some of the stores. And what I found is a lot of times these cards are mostly mammals, so they're really nice to put together a mammal exercise. I found that when children are studying mammals, there is so much that we can do to draw them into research. When we talk about, do mammals only live on the land? Well, no, of course they don't. So maybe you would want to do some very simple research and just find out all the different kinds of marine mammals that exist. So that's the kind of research that even a pretty young child can do, especially if you have materials in the classroom that can help them with that. So let's say you have a collection of mammal figures in your class and you've put this together and you've bought one or more sets of animal cards. There's a good chance that most of what's in there are mammals. And I use this one for that purpose. I do keep the amphibian, the reptiles, and the birds in there as a contrast. What is a mammal? What's not a mammal? It has feathers, it has, um, it starts out as a tadpole, has scales, not a mammal. So what if then you find that you need to fill in? So you happen to have figures for 25 mammals and you've got cards from this set for 20. Well, one of the best ways to fill in is with the help of the company that makes a lot of those little uh, figures that, that you, um, you purchased. Now, when I purchase the little figures that come in what are called tubes, T-O-O-B-S, I do tend to purchase them from a store that has a 40% off coupon and kind of max out what I can purchase from there for the ones that are really valuable. Some of them, you know, with fairies and things, I'm not interested in those, but, but pretty much all of the ones that have to do with zoology, I found are useful to, to adapt for exercises in the classroom. So you would put them together for a mammals exercise and you've got a few that you don't have a card for. Well, if you order the ones that you can't get easily at a big box store directly from the company, they will start sending you uh, catalogs that look like this. And guess what? There are your illustrations that you could use to make those few cards that you still needed. Let me see if I can find one that well, maybe, maybe these might be some of the mammals, including a, a possum or something like that, that you wouldn't have a card for. So this is one way to use a resource that would come to you free if you are ordering from, from them, 
so you could finish out that card set. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to organize these exercises and about plastics in the classroom. Um, if you're organizing the exercises, an ocean biome would certainly be appropriate, and you can kind of combine that with your study of invertebrates. So what you can see here, I've got some cards that I got from a dollar store, some that I printed off um, from, from the internet, and I'm going to talk about plastic with this in front of me because if you have the real thing, don't put plastic in your classroom. If you've got real starfish that you can, or sea stars that you can uh, put out on your shelf, then do that. And yes, they break, and that's part of the control of error in the Montessori classroom, but sometimes we don't have that. I can't put an octopus or a stonefish or a narwhal on my shelf, and it's to my mind, even if it's not even the greatest of models, worthwhile to do that, to have the children to be able to hold them, to be able to examine them, to be able to organize with them, and even see some of the, the, the effects of them. Now this is a kind of a strange plastic, but in its way it replicates the fact that there are some things in the ocean that actually have a very interesting light quality to them. Now maybe this has that light quality and the real creature doesn't. That's where we need to do a little bit of research before we use them for the children. But having sea anemones, having nidarians in your work on the shelf, to me it's worth it to have even the plastic figures that aren't as nice as, say, my beautiful hand-painted tray is here. So I do think using plastics is worthwhile. I do think using them to explain concepts is worthwhile. If you have a not very expensive model of a whale, you could potentially use something like this to help teach scale. If you have a pretty large whale and then tiny other little models, you can help the children realize just what the scale of those creatures are. And that goes in the other direction as well. If you've got a set of arthropods or Let's see, my, my little set from here is a pretty good example. Obviously, this is not to scale with my, um, <laughs> with my, uh, my creatures that are here. Uh, my, my lizard and my kangaroo are not in scale to each other, and that would be something you would want to point out to the children once they're old enough to understand that. And the last thing that I want to say in this segment is, Organize your materials so that you have everything at hand that will let you make the most of what you're doing with the children. Get all of your mammal things together. Once you've ha got that together, decide how you can go into more depth. If you have a set of primates, if you've got other material that you've been gathering from your National Geographics, um, from other books that you've been using, Bring those things together so that when you're using these fun, attractive little objects with the children, you can draw them into the depth and that you can make your presentations interesting, exciting, things that will draw those children into work that they wouldn't have otherwise done. And I wish you the best of luck as you are organizing your zoology materials for the best use of your students and your children. So how do you decide how to make best use of these funny little things that are so available to us now as Montessori zoologists? Well, I have here a, um, oh my goodness, I can't even remember the name of it. So fortunately, I can look on its belly, if it is one of the at least reasonably better made things, a halflinger. This is a halflinger, which is a very um, small horse, and I would put this in with domestic animals. That would be the way I think would be the best way to use this so that the students could compare with other animal figures, other domestic, um, excuse me, other horse figures, other domestic animal figures, and get interested in going into in-depth on a study of horses, on a study of animals that humans have tamed, have, have brought into their lives to make their lives better along with dogs. 
how would I use the mongoose? Well, now with the mongoose, I would definitely either put it into the biome where it belongs or into the mammal section because the nature of the mongoose, its movement, the way that it uh, maintains itself, it's so interesting. I would want the children to be interested in that. I wouldn't want it to just be sorted into a bunch of mammals or just matched to its name. I want the children to be interested in how the mongoose lives. Now, what about this last creature? Well, I'm not entirely sure this is anything, but I can tell from looking at it that it is either prehistoric or it's kind of useless. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my objects, my cards, my books for the timeline of life and see whether or not it has a place in that section. Anytime you're evaluating using these little figures in your classroom, think to yourself, how am I going to draw out concentrated work? How am I going to use this object to lead into an in-depth study of the anatomy of an insect, an in-depth study into breeds of horses, an in-depth study into prey animals and, and predator animals through finding out just a little bit about a mongoose? That's the way you can use these materials that are interesting to the children to draw them in.